Well, I guess that's close enough to the start. So let's get the ball rolling, shall we? First of all, thank you all very much for being here and welcome to ETG's Bringing Travel Home. My name is Kate and I'm Head of Client Experience for Experience Travel Group. Uh, it is a slightly different role for me at the moment than what I'm used to. But thank you for coming to your screens to join us for this evening. Uh, before we kick off, um, I just have a few housekeeping things to run through. Usually that would me do, be directing you to the fire exits and where the bars are so you can get a refill and what time the nibbles are coming round. But unfortunately, those are all in your control tonight. Um, so I've got a slightly different list for us. Firstly, because there are quite a few of us on this, I have muted everyone. Please don't take offence to this. Uh, it is just to try and ensure a smooth running of the event. And it is just so that we hopefully don't have any background noise and we can all focus and hear uh, the main event uh, well enough there. Secondly, um, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with Zoom at the moment, possibly too familiar. But I just wanted to point out that we do have two view options. So you have your speaker view where you have the main person, i.e. myself, taking up the whole of the screen. I would recommend this option. That way you get to see all of my, Melissa's and John's lovely faces throughout the evening. But if you are a little bit intrigued about who else we have on this call here, you do also have gallery view, which you can choose to use at your leisure. Now, if you do want to switch between the two of them, that is in the top right-hand corner of your Zoom screen there. So you've got gallery view and speaker view. Again, I would recommend speaker view. Uh, the other thing that we have as an option here is chat. Now that will be down the bottom of your screen. You may have used it previously, uh, but on the bottom menu there, you have the chat function. And this is if you have any questions that come up through the evening for John, you can send those to me. And if we have time at the end, uh, we will get to them and ask John. Now, for the evening, I'm going to pass over to Melissa shortly to do a short introduction to these events and such. And then she will pass over to John for the main portion of the evening. Um, once John's finished, we will have some time to run through some questions. Uh, we'll answer those a bit and then we'll go back to Melissa just for a final wrap up and then I will just end everything uh, and close off the evening. So hopefully that all makes sense and hopefully you've got your glasses filled and your screens working uh, and I will pass over now to Melissa to carry on from here. Hi everyone. Um, now I know, first of all, I know some of you might have been expecting to see Sam tonight, but unfortunately he's had to attend to a family matter. So I've, I've stepped in to host. So I'm Melissa. I'm one of the directors at ETG um, with, with Sam and Tom, and it's great to get to welcome you here um, to our first ever Bringing Travel Home event. Um, I don't know you all personally, but it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. I've, I've been at ETG since the very early days. Um, I joined in about 2006 and um, just as we launched our first holidays to Southeast Asia. And I, I can see on the list that we've got people here who've supported us since the, the very beginning. In fact, I think some of you have travelled with us many times. Um, but it's also great to see some names of people who'd begun trips who had expected to start holidays with us this spring. Um, just as life completely blindsided us all and the world went into lockdown. Um, I was quite involved behind the scenes in helping reschedule holidays or with the arrangements to, to get some of you home from Vietnam and Thailand and from the, the cricket test that never was in, in Sri Lanka. Um, so hopefully I, I don't sound um, too weird and like a stalker of some kind when I say that lots of your names are very familiar um, and it's really great to have you here with us. Um, quite a few of the ETG team are on the call as well and I, I think I speak for all of them and all of us when I say how pleased we are to be hosting what we hope will be the first of this kind of event. Um, like everyone else, um, the last few months have been a bit weird for us so it's really exciting for us to be back doing what we do best, um, planning and talking about travel again. Um, we, we've had the idea for, for something like this, um, for the, this Bringing Travel Home series for quite a long time. Um, we hosted a dinner at the um, French deli near our old office in Clapham quite a few years ago um, that was really successful and everyone that came along just seemed to really enjoy being able to meet and chat to other people um, who shared their passion for travel and we wanted to create a forum to do that kind of 
thing again. Um, now, obviously, the irony of, of all of this is that we can't exactly chat in that way at the moment. Um, and of course, we can't travel very far either. Um, but that made us think it was, it was kind of more important than ever, really, to find a way to, to remind ourselves of the good and the great that travel brings to us all. Um, and I'm talking about things like the chance encounters, the shared moments, and I, I guess the sense of discovery that we all love about travel. So we decided to kick off um, these events centered around a special guest or, or a particular theme instead of all kind of sitting around chatting to each other. So this month, we're really pre pleased to introduce John Gimlet, who I think some of you may well have met before. Um, John's an old friend of ETG and a fantastic author whose own travel encounters have inspired several books um, and articles. And John's book, The Elephant Complex, paints a superb portrait of um, Sri Lanka really getting under the surface of the island, its culture and, and its many nuances. And, and I think that's something that we aim to sort of um, do with our holidays as well. So we're really pleased that we found a way to bring our travel community together to talk about travel in this way. And I'm sure you'll feel inspired by John um, and his wonderful travel writing. So that's all from me. Um, and I will hand over to John. Great. Can you hear me? Sounds like you can. Katie and Melissa, thank you very much for that lovely welcome. And welcome to all of you. You're all about the size of postage stamps, but um, I, I can see your heads bobbing around. So it's jolly nice to see you all. And thank you for joining me on this little literary journey, I suppose, our, our armchair travel in the real sense. Um, I have to say it's a somewhat daunting thought, speaking to such a a well-traveled and well-read audience uh, as yourselves, but at least amongst outsiders, I can be confident of this, that with Sri Lanka, we're all struggling for meaning. As one UN diplomat put it some years ago, the longer you know Sri Lanka, the less you understand. And I wish I'd understood that when I first thought about this project uh, back in 2009. At that time, uh, the country was in the grip of a 26 year or towards the end of a 26 year civil war. Uh, and it was a very odd war, of course, because at one time you might have an artillery duel going on at one end of the island, while at the other end of the island, there would be a luxury tourist industry. Everything about this war uh, was very odd. Um, at one point, peacekeepers appeared from India, as it turned out as it turned out, and ended up getting shot by both sides. On another occasion, 5,000 guerrillas simply changed sides overnight. And then, in, in, in circumstances that no one, no one really truly understands, it simply ended Asia's longest ever civil war. So what did it feel like, I wondered, after 26 years of civil war? Was it still the paradise that other writers had uh, spoken about? And how did it come to this? Well, by 2013, I was ready. I built up a library of books on Sri Lanka and I'd interviewed lots of people in London and made lots of contacts and so on. And it was interesting interviewing people in London because they all said such different things about Sri Lanka that I began to wonder if there were lots of Sri Lankas. Anyway, I was ready. Now, tonight's talk is going to follow a slightly different format to perhaps what you're used to. Usually what I do on these events is I would show photographs and I took some 4,000 photographs during the three months that I was in Sri Lanka and obviously I don't tend to show them all at once. But it's going to be a little bit different tonight because instead of showing photographs, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey in 10 objects. Now, some of these objects are quite small, so you might want to get the full screen rather than the, the split screen. Um, it's funny having objects. I'm an industrious collector of junk and specimens, uh, as my wife will bear witness. She calls my study the Craparium, because it's full of baboon skulls and cannonballs and Vietnamese bayonets and fox bits of fox skeletons all sorts of rubbish but amongst all these treasures as i call them i brought some things back from um, sri lanka and you may ask yourself well, why do you do this why do you collect all this stuff 
And the answer is that partly it helps my memory when I'm writing to have these things in front of me. But it's also about credibility. I have a, a, a terrible fear of not being believed. And I feel somehow having things there uh, sort of bears witness to some of the things that I've seen or some of the people I've met, perhaps. The first object I'm going to start with is this one. And it's a log from the... It's a log from, can you see that all right, like that? From the greatest, the largest tree in the world. Now, it's a reminder really of the natural wonders of this fabulous island. Uh, I, I don't suppose ever again I'll see such consistently lovely landscapes, beautiful in both panorama and in their detail. And although Sri Lanka is only the size of Ireland, it rises to two and a half thousand metres. In other words, the height of a ski resort. And when weather systems coming in off the Indian Ocean hit this land mass, they burst, creating a land that's both Africa dry and fabulously lush. And of course, for the people that live there, it's covered in food. And for the animals, it's like an enormous salad. And it's home to a startling array of creatures, including the greatest uh, land animal in the world, the elephant, the greatest creature that's ever roamed the planet, the blue whale, and one of the largest concentration of leopards anywhere. This tree is slightly different. I'd heard about it. It was said to be the biggest tree in the world. And what it is, it's part of a Java fig tree. And I'd heard about this tree that was growing in the Peridinaya gardens in Kandy. And so I made a special expedition to go and find it. And I'd seen these trees before. And the Java fig spreads beautifully and covers an area uh, roughly the size of a football pitch in some cases. And when you walk beneath the branches, it's like going inside a theatre. It's the most fantastic spectacle apart from anything else. So there it was. I arrived at the at university gardens, botanical gardens, and I made my way to where I thought the tree would be. And when I got there, there was just a pile of sawdust and these logs. And at that moment, one of the gardeners came over and I said, you're really unlucky. You've just lost your tree. And he said, well, we're not as unlucky as you are. This tree has been here for generations and you missed it by two days. <laughs> My next uh, uh, item that I want to show you is, is this. This is a copy of Tamil Yellow Pages printed in London. And the reason I want to show you this is because really my journey begins uh, right here uh, near Tooting. Tooting is only a couple of miles uh, in that direction, 10 minutes away on the bus. And it's worth bearing in mind that in Tooting alone, there are 8,000 Sri Lankan Tamils. That means there are more Sri Lankan Tamils in Tooting than there were ever British in Ceylon at the height of the empire. And the Tamils that live in London, in Tooting, there are 120,000 altogether in London, 120,000 Sri Lankan Tamils. The, the Tamils that live here live in their own uh, very introspective world. And this uh, lovely, uh, Yellow Pages gives a really intriguing glimpse into that world. You can find Tamil cake decorators, and Tamil roofers, Tamil photographers, uh, there's a Tamil, a Tamil disco, I think, if you want that. Uh, you can find uh, people who'll make you Tamil tiger decorations, if that's what you want. Uh, what have we got here? Lots of wedding things, lots of Tamil charities. And the Tamils in London have their own clubs, their own schools and their own dancing uh, academies. They even have their own internal crime wave with gangs like the Jaffna Boys and the Tamil Posse. And you know what? London hardly seems to notice at all. So there you are, item two, Tamil Yellow Pages. My third item is a flag. Here it is. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation. There are 22 Tamil temples in London. And in my local one here, 
um, I got to know the spiritual advisor to the temple. And it turned out that he was a former sort of bookkeeper, as it were, for the Tamil Tigers. And to prove it, he gave me their flag. And here it is. Some of you will have seen this flag. It's actually, strictly speaking, uh, illegal in this country, certainly illegal to wave it in, com in, in public because this is a prescribed terrorist organization. But what he explained about it was back in the 90s, he would gather in money from the Tamil community in Tooting, Wembley, Ealing, and all these areas. He'd take the money to Barclays Bank on Tooting High Street, and he'd send it in units, maybe 100,000 pounds a go, to Eastern European arms companies. The arms would be transshipped to Singapore and then transshipped through the Tamil Tigers' own navy to, to the war in Sri Lanka. And it's a curious thought to think that all this process began right here under our noses in Tooting. Anyway, that's that flag. I can't think of a more violent looking flag than that, with its bayonets and bullets and the growling tiger uh, in the middle of it. I have to say that many of the people in Tooting, the Tamils and around London are not supporters of the LTT, LTT the Tamil Tigers, uh, but there are many who are. And in Tooting, a lot of them are from a little village right up in the north. And if you ever go to, to Jaffa, it's a very charming village on the coast called Velvetiterai, which means Cotton Harbour, because they used to export to India from there. And there is strong support there uh, in Tooting. And if you read the Colombo newspapers, what they have to say about Tooting, they regard it as a sort of um, a, a Mogadishu, as it were, a sort of hotbed of revolt and terrorism, which I always find rather strange, considering it's where I go and get my mangoes. Anyway, the next item I want to show you is this. We're on item number four, this little wonderful freeze. Now, uh, you will see plenty of things like this when you go to Anuradhapura and Polonarua. This actually came from a, a government gift shop. Uh, it cost two quid, uh, but it's a very beautiful little item. And it's a reminder that in Sri Lanka, it's possible to be both holy and sensuous at the same time. And it's also a reminder of the uh, remarkable city that they used to be in Sri Lanka between the 6th century BC and 1290. And these were cities that were known to the Romans, cities of up to a million people each, uh, cities that had some of the world's first vets, first facilities for disabled people and so on. But the real achievement of these cities for me was the, the hydrology. The reservoir kings, the kings of that time, could irrigate Sri Lanka and bring water down from the highlands, sometimes hundreds of miles to make the desert uh, bloom. And it became fabulously wealthy in the pre-medieval period. Unfortunately, of course, wealth brought jealousy and invasion, and invasion brought destruction. The hydrology failed, causing flooding. And that brought malaria. And in the end, the cities simply failed. And for 600 years, these cities completely disappeared, and Anuradhapura was only rediscovered by British soldiers in 1820. Imagine their surprise. Now, my next item, number five, is very, very small. So I'm going to have to put it on. No, that's not quite tall enough. Is that going to do it? Okay, it's not really, I can't really put it on there. So what it is, it's a little seed in the shape of a, a snake's head. And this comes from the Veda community. And the Vedas are the original Aboriginal uh, population of uh, Sri Lanka. And they've been hunting these forests for around 32,000 years. And they, uh, there's probably only about 500 of them left. It's certainly a pure bred Veda stock. And they're confined to a tiny area to the east of the country. They're a very curious people. They have their own language. So for example, it's an onomatopoeic language. So for example, a motorbike is a hutu hutu. And uh, their word for the English language uh, literally translates as birds shouting because that's what they think we sound like. 
And traditionally, they had no use for names. They just called each other fat boy or oldie or whatever came to mind, really. Uh, they never farm, they hunt or forage for honey. But I'm afraid modern life hasn't really uh, suited them. And in the Civil War, they had all their guns uh, confiscated. And now their king spends his time bottling honey or petitioning the United Nations or entertaining visitors like me. Anyway, my favourite of these hunters was uh, a man called Sudu. And uh, Sudu was very keen to make me a bow and arrow, one of those great long bows, sort of five feet long. And I explained to him that these things are, uh, they won't go on our aeroplanes, I'd never get it home. And, and so he said, fine. And instead, he gave me this little item, the snake's head, and he said that it would protect me uh, against snakes. And sure enough, that night, uh, two snakes uh, came up to my tent uh, in the forest. And um, uh, obviously the charm worked because they both wriggled off in the other direction. And then Sudu himself appeared from the long grass. And uh, he had in his hands this, uh, this little bow here. And he said, uh, I I've made this for you. It should be just the right size for one of your aeroplanes. So there it is. The next item is item number six, and it's a bit of broken roof tile. And this item belongs to a much uh, later and more violent period of British, early British colonialism. So the British arrived in the uh, 1790s, taking over from the Dutch, and in 1815, for the first time, uh, they managed to unite the whole uh, island by capturing the Kingdom of Candy. And they did so not, by, not so much by uh, political, uh, by military prowess, but by a mixture of guile and trickery and bribery and great intelligence. And the aristocracy who had really sold out to the British it didn't take them long to get rather fed up with their new masters. So in 1817, there was uh, a great revolt and 16,000 Candian warriors poured out of the hills uh, to lay waste to British occupied uh, Ceylon. And uh, that year, no crops were uh, sown or harvested and 10,000 people died of the famine. Of the British, only 45 soldiers were killed in combat, but one in five Europeans died in, on the island that year uh, perished. So it was a, a sort of a real low point in the story of Ceylon and certainly the story of British Ceylon. And what the British did to bring this revolt under control was they sent out very small parties of soldiers to raid villages and actually just to burn them down and to do the scorched earth policy. And one of the soldiers in charge of one of these groups was the infamous Captain MacDonald. And at one point, Captain MacDonald found himself completely surrounded in a tiny fort uh, by 7,000 Candian warriors. He only had 60 men with him. And that was the 28th of February, uh, 1818. And so there he was in his little fort, and for uh, something like a week or so, the British soldiers, this tiny cabal of British soldiers, managed to hold off the Canyon warriors, who eventually ran out of rice and sort of wandered off. And so Captain MacDonald triumphed. And this is really all that remains of his fort, which was named after him. So he's now MacDonald of Fort MacDonald. And you can go there if you want. It's really not very far from Norelia. It's now uh, just a little school. And I spoke to the headmaster and I said to him, you know, do the children here ever find anything else apart from bits of roof tile? And he said, no, they don't really. They don't find anything at all. Um, he said, uh, but they do hear quite a lot of voices. So my next little item is, uh, this. This is item seven, and it's a little, I don't know if you can see that well enough, it's a little um, 
It's black, it's a sort of nodule. It feels like glass. Uh, it's very shiny. Um, you might think it's lava if you were to try and guess, uh, but it's not, it's none of those things. And the story here is that um, uh, you need to go to the, the naval dockyard in Trinco Malie. I don't know if anybody has ever been there. If you're in Trinco, it's well worth going to. There's a little museum. It's a beautiful uh, naval dockyard. And when you go inside, you find it's pretty much as the British left it. It's even got streets with names like Waterloo Road and Cambridge Circus and things like that. So I went there really to tell the story of what happened there in the Second World War. And it's really exactly the same as it was that day in April 1942, when uh, an enormous fleet of aeroplanes arrived in the sky. And in that fleet, there were 91 bombers and 38 fighters. And it was, of course, uh, the same fleet of planes that had raided Pearl Harbor. When they came into Trinco, they filled 15 square miles of sky. It must have been an absolutely awesome sight. And fortunately for the British, they got wind of the fact they were coming, and the Navy had managed to get most of their ships out, hide them in the Maldives. But one or two ships were sunk, including the Sai Gang, which is still there in the harbor, still tied up against the quay. It was carrying whiskey and ammunition at the time, and as you can imagine, it burnt pretty well. You can still see it and ask the, ask the Navy guys to show you when you go there, go and have a look at this SAR gang. Anyway, the British did manage to fire back and did manage to hit one of these Japanese planes. And the stricken Japanese plane crew decided to turn their plane into a human bomb. And over on the other side of the harbor were a hundred or so enormous tanks of aviation fuel and maritime fuel. And the Japanese plane decided to seek out one of those tanks and crash into it. So I got some friends in the Navy to take me over to these tanks. They're absolutely vast. Each tank is like an office block in itself and holds 15,000 tons of oil. They are, of course, all empty and abandoned now. Anyway, so I'd heard in the, in the history that the Japanese plane did manage to find one of these tanks, tank number 91, and managed to steer its plane right into it and blew it up. And the tank burnt for a week, so it said. And the whole thing melted. And when you go there now, it, it looks like a sort of rusty pavlova. It's all sort of sunk in on itself, a remarkable sight. And it's one of those moments on my journey when I felt that you know, you peel back the layer and there's the history underneath. And what you see in the ground there is this. And this is, um, I suppose, aviation fuel or maritime fuel that's mixed with the sand and heated to a really high temperature such that the sand itself has melted and turned into a sort of semi-glass, I suppose. So an extraordinary record of the ferocity of, of that day. All right, so let's take us to a rather more modern period. And I don't know if anybody has ever been up to the area of the more modern civil war, uh, which as you probably know, raged between 1986 and 2009, 26 years of it. It's a long and complicated story, but it all ends on the Nanthi Kadal Lagoon. And what you get when you visit these uh, sites is there's still a huge amount of, of just stuff lying around. So anti-aircraft shells that have exploded, um, a 40 millimeter tank grenade, a uh, rocket propelled grenade, lots of these bullets, the whole tray of them here. And, and then I found this, this is part of a, uh, Tamil Tigers uniform. Some of you will, if you've ever seen pictures of the Tamil Tigers, you'll recognize their very distinctive tiger stripes that they had on their uniform. And that's just lying there in the dirt, more bullets and, what's that, I don't know, is that a morphine file? Somebody might know what it is. But it's lying there amongst the bullets. And it gives you some idea of the, uh, of the trauma of that place. And as you know, the Sri Lankan army surrounded the last of the Tamil Tigers and a huge number of civilians too. 
And not only do you find this little junk there, the bullets and the morphine files and bits of uniform, you find the suitcases of the refugees. And by the time I got there, they were four years old, but they were still full of clothes bursting everywhere. There are something like, uh, I must get this right, 10,000 burnt out motorbikes on that site in Nancy Cadal and 25,000 ruined bicycles. This is all in an area that's really no bigger than Central Park. And in the end, 130,000 uh, um, civilians surrendered there. Uh, there were something like 5,000 LTE cadres, most of whom were shot on the battlefield under the army's orders. And it's, it's a curiously lovely place today, even though there's still a bit of junk there. Most of it has probably been cleared up since I was there. But, you know, apart from anything else, it's worth visiting because it's a rather beautiful place, this lagoon. And it's very remote and dry part of Sri Lanka. So well worth the, well worth the trip. Of course, what happened is controversial, and one hopes that one day there'll be an inquiry into exactly what happened, and you'll form your own view as to whether you want to go there and, uh, and see it for yourself. One of the really curious features, and it's my ninth object really leads on from that, uh, was uh, this ship. And I don't know if any of you have seen this, this, this was the first edition of my book, and this uh, ship, which was called the Farrah 3, was marooned on the beach. And there's more photograph photographs of it inside the, the book. And it's a really beautiful sight. You could go inside this ship, the sea had come inside. It had a rather sort of cathedral-like uh, atmosphere. <clears throat> and what it was, it had been captured by the LTT on the high seas. They brought it in, they crashed it on the shore. They'd uh, stripped it of valuables. It was actually full of cement and motorbikes. There was a glut of those throughout the Tamil Tigers world for a while. Uh, and then on the 14th of May, 2009, the very last day of the Civil War, the LTT used this ship as uh, their last sort of, sort of stronghold, if you like. And they holed up in there and the Sri Lankan army attacked it, first of all, with bullets and then with uh, armor piercing bullets and, and then with tanks and this is a, a little piece of the uh, ship um, what's interesting about it is that if you look carefully you'll see that there's a sort of dent in it and that is a, a bullet that has sort of meshed itself in with the ironwork of the ship and the whole of this ship is like a colander it's just covered in these bullets and bullet holes and again, it gives you a real sense <clears throat> of the very ferocity of the, of the last day of that war. And now, of course, it's a beautiful scene, one of the most beautiful beaches you can imagine. I think the ship has gone now, it's been taken away by the Japanese for scrap. But it's really uh, just an extraordinary, extraordinary sight, uh, something I won't easily forget. Now, my last little item, I think, is probably one of my favourites. It's, it's this, little, this, little, this little thing. I don't know if you can see that, all right? Uh, perhaps I can build it up a bit. How's that looking? There we are. So, this little piece comes from Jaffna. And, again, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to go to Jaffna. It's a, a really lovely city. It's India light. People in Jaffna work extremely hard, they're very conscientious, they're very diligent, uh, and they're very traumatized. They had a terrible war. At one stage, the LTT moved the whole population out. There was nothing left in the city except disabled people, the elderly, and dogs. And this was a desperately traumatic time. And large parts of the city were bombed. They're all rapidly being rebuilt now, starting with the ice cream shops. The Japanese love their ice cream. You can get very good ice cream there. And all sorts of businesses are sprouting again out of the ruins. One of my favorite was a, um, was a funeral parlor, which had a neon light that said funerals, Eason's funerals. And then it said in flashing light, day or night service. And uh, I thought that was lovely. But um, it sometimes seems that one of the things that's um, survived unscathed from this is these old British cars. So these are really relics from the 50s. 
and 60s. They are Hillman's, uh, Austin Cambridge's, Somerset's and Oxford's. And they are in immaculate condition very often because during most of the Civil War, it's impossible for the Japanese to get hold of cars. So they restored these ones. They lovingly looked after the engines and the bodywork. And you can buy one now <clears throat> for around 5,000 quid, almost in pristine order. And it makes Jaffna like the sort of Havana of Asia. But instead of American cars, it's got these beautiful machines here. And I remember on one occasion meeting a holy man a very, very low caste. And he was driving something like this uh, in between jobs. His job is to, uh, to go, when someone dies, his job is to go and wash the body. And that makes him very impure, very low caste. But he was a nice fellow, and so we stopped by the side of the road, we had a little chat, and uh, he said that his car, which was an Austin A50, had been given to him by his father, and being so low caste, it was really his only possession in the entire world, this lovely uh, Austin A50. Um, I suppose a bit like this, I don't think that's an Austin A50. Uh, that was a lovely idea to own nothing in the world but an Austin A50. So, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. That's my Sri Lanka in 10 simple little objects. I'd always expected to, that Sri Lankans would be a bit more dismissive of my take on Sri Lanka, but they are surprisingly, and have been surprisingly forgiving, and I've been back to do literary festival talks in Gaul, uh, to a great welcome and great interest. And I'm always slightly surprised by how forgiving they are. But then perhaps Sri Lankans understand better than anyone else how complex life is in this really beautiful land. Well, as they say in Colombo, tikak pisu, it's all a bit crazy. So there it is. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. We're all right for time. Yes, we are, I think. We are, yes. Wonderful, John, thank you. As a, a bit of a collector of trinkets myself, I really appreciated all of those. <laughs> I, I know exactly the feeling of the little memories that come with them. Uh, we do actually have a few questions. Um, some of them have come through uh, previously, so it's not exactly connected to what you've just discussed, but I think they're quite interesting all the same. So we'll go ahead with those. Um, I believe Jonathan Tross had something to ask. Let me just unmute you there so you can go ahead and ask your question, John. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you very much, John. Really enjoyed that and the, and the book. The thing that you sort of allude to, but has long puzzled us going to Sri Lanka, is how do you square the warm, welcoming people living in this, this paradise with the history which goes back before the um, Terrible Tigers, which you write about very, very, very well. Um, of, of doing unspeakable things to each other. And, and it always seems a, a contrast that I, I just puzzle to understand and be interested in your take on that. John, it's a really good question. And it's a question that has often troubled me and still does trouble me. I have to be honest, but I don't have an answer to it. I mean, I can describe the phenomenon. And it's, it, it's just one of the areas that uh, it's very difficult for us outsiders to understand. And my misunderstanding of Sri Lanka begins with the very title of this book, and, and it carries all the way through. And I hope that you can go to Sri Lanka, misunderstand it, and still enjoy it. It is really difficult to work out what is going on here. It's not just this, this rage that is just below the surface which very occasionally overboils. People did just very occasionally explode with rage and say, you know, why did the British start this war? I mean, and I go, well, I don't think they did. I mean, you know, and they didn't, but it's just a rage that, and then they don't really mean that. So no, I don't mean the British, it's the Americans who started it. No, no, I don't think it was the Americans either. And, and there's just, just this, under, under the surface, this, this frustration and rage. I don't know why it is. Some people say, and I, I don't really feel qualified to agree or disagree, some people say it's part of a, a, a sort of Buddhist philosophy that on the surface everything 
everything is sort of calm and serene and you have a duty of calmness and serenity and it actually causes a pent-up frustration sort of deep down within whether that's really true or not or whether it's really fair is another matter because it's not necessary just uh, the buddhists who experience that i mean sri lanka is a country of many religions uh, there's, there's something else really odd going on that sometimes you can know sri lankans for quite some time i'm thinking in particular of a hotel manager who got very friendly with and knew him for days and we chat about all sorts of things then on about the third day he'd said uh we're talking about the tsunami and he said yeah, I, I, yeah of course i remember the tsunami he said my wife and all my children were killed and i thought how did that not emerge in the conversation earlier i mean that's such a big thing in your life you know how, how did i not know that in three days and these sort of things used to just really throw me all the time and they still do. I, I, I really struggle. I don't know whether anybody else has got any thoughts on that, but I, I remain as mystified as I was on day one. It's complex. There's a lot to it, I guess. <laughs> um, and similarly, we have another question here. Um, I was there just as the war ended and found it hard with how little understanding there was about the trauma that the Tamils might have suffered. Do you know whether there's any understanding about how much work there is to do to reunite and return, return sorry, some sense of allowing each other to be human? Yeah, I, I, I think there is some understanding. You know, I look, Sri Lankans are generally very good people. They're very charitable. They're the most charitable people in the world. They give away far more than anything else. And there is a real charitable tendency within Sri Lanka. So you'll meet people of, of all colours and stripes in Sri Lanka who are genuinely concerned about the trauma that this has caused, not just to themselves, but also to their neighbours, the Tamils. And you'll see great cricketers going up to Jaffna, offering cricket as a kind of therapy, it sometimes falls on stony ground. But, you know, at least they're trying. And Sri Lankans do try to offer whatever trauma therapy they can, but it's expensive and it's difficult. And the Tamils, Tamils are quite self-contained. They're not really interested in the charity of the South. They are pretty good at looking after themselves. There's a vast diaspora of whatever it is. Uh, it's probably a half a million to a million people sending money back it used to be from this country it used to be during the war two hundred thousand pounds a month was going back to support the tamil tigers and you know similar amounts are going back for rebuilding and so on so the tamils are sort of looking after themselves to that extent so it's a bit frustrating there's all sorts of political things going on as well and this this present government uh, has been accused of being somewhat triumphalist and merciless uh, in its approach to the Japanese and the Tamils of the North. Uh, one hopes that that will dissipate. The only way forward for this country is for everybody to get together. One can only hope that will, will happen. Mm. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. I'm afraid it's an incomplete process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and do you find that there remains to be a lot of significant tension between the different religions and the different people there? Is that kind of what you felt? One reads about it, one knows about it. You won't witness it. And I think this is a really important thing that you, know, you can go to Sri Lanka as an outsider and not really, if you want to, and not really be aware of any of this. If you want to have a lovely holiday and enjoy the lovely food, the best beaches, the lovely countryside, you can and you don't need to be aware of any of this. If you want to know about it, you want to read about it and ask people about it, then yeah, the story is, is all there. But they won't, they, the, Sri Lankans don't like wearing their problem on their sleeve. So they don't really like, as we British don't either, but you know, they don't really like admitting to the sectarian tensions that clearly do exist one knows they exist because you read about them between the buddhists uh, the buddhist nationalists i should say most buddhists are not really involved in this 
and the Tamil nationalists, or the Tamil nationalists and the Muslim nationalists. There's a three-way tension going on there. Um, they won't really admit to it or readily tell you. You know, you've got to trust people before they'll tell you about it. Um, this, but this is part of a really old phenomenon in, in Sri Lanka. It's not just about the Civil War. Some of you will know about the JVP revolts in the mid-70s and late 80s, when this young Marxist revolt sprung up twice and the army responded with extraordinary violence. And on the first revolt, maybe 10,000 people died, and on the second, maybe 60,000. And nobody ever talks about this. It's a real elephant in the room. You know, you'll go to a dinner party in Colombo, and you know, you, when you're changing the subject, you'll say, uh, you know, does anybody remember the JVP revolts? And there'll be this sort of stunned silence around the table, as if you'd said something really terrible. And then uh, people will have a little bit more to drink, and they'll, <laughs> they'll say, yeah, we do remember it. It was the most terrifying time of our life. It was far more frightening than the Civil War. And gradually, little bits and pieces will come out about this terrible time. I'll tell you where it's best described in Michael Ondarch's book, um, Running in the Family. And he gets across some of that terrible fear during that time. But then, then it's forgotten about. It's all gone. And yeah. it's, like, it's all lovely again. You know? <laughs> it's, it's really, it's weird and it's interesting. It's really hard to understand. Amazing. That's, yeah. that's Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, mentioned in that answer the, the wonderful trips and travels that you could do in, <laughs> in Sri Lanka, and that, that moves us nicely into uh, a big Bob Williams had a question around that. Bob, are you there? Can I, I am. bring you in? Yep. Uh, John, thanks very much for your chat, and uh, enjoyed it very much. That's um, very fun. We, uh, we had a rather curtailed first visit in March, we were going for 18 days, came back after four, um, but we decided to return. So given that we're traveling with Experience Travel Group, uh, what would you recommend as the three most memorable experiences uh, for, some, for a couple new to Sri Lanka? Well, that's a, that, again, that's a really good question. What, what I'd always recommend to, to a first time visitor is to do a fairly standard uh, cultural triangle because you know going to Anuradhapura uh, Anur and uh, Polonnaruwa and then down to Gaul stopping the tea plantation you get a really good introduction to uh, Sri Lanka in, in all its majesty you know in a trip like that in, in a week or two weeks you're going to see the the reservoir cities that I've talked about beautiful tea gardens I and mean, it's just the most beautiful landscapes probably in the world I and mean, it's really stunning and then go to Gaunt Gaul which is a real treat <clears throat> and and I would do that trip time and time again I absolutely love it but if if on your second trip you feel you've done some of that and want to do something slightly different then I have a couple of recommendations um, first of all and it may seem rather odd this uh, one of them is Colombo Colombo often gets missed out on an itinerary. Often people arrive at the airport and then go shooting off another four hour car journey somewhere else. Personally, I think that's a mistake. I think you should, after your terrible flight, you should get out and you should go and stay in the Gaulface Hotel, which is just lovely, an old colonial hotel on Gaulface Green. It's got the ocean on one side and Colombo on the other. And you walk into this building and all, you know, just another era opens up. It's just been done up. The rooms are fabulous. The breakfast is to die for. It's like a sort of derba in the morning. All these uniformed staff bearing these silver pots of gorgeous food. And there's even an official crow scarer with a bow tie and a catapult to keep the crows off your breakfast. It, it, the whole experience is just unforgettable. And um, there's lots to do in Colombo. So you know, don't miss it out. On your second trip, spare a bit of time for Colombo. So that's that. Also, I've mentioned Jaffna. I love Jaffna. It's completely different. It feels more like India. It's got some lovely things to see, forts, uh, uh, amazing sort of Mughal architecture and so on. And then you can go out to the islands of Jaffna and maybe stay the night on Hammond Isle, which is the old Portuguese fort in the middle of the ocean, 
really, really worth seeing. Then my third experience for your second trip would be go to a little lodge, probably my <clears throat> favorite or second favorite hotel in uh, Sri Lanka called Galkadua Forest Lodge. And I've mentioned it in the book, so you'll find it in the index. <clears throat> it's a tiny hotel, only three rooms. The rooms don't have any external walls, only internal walls. So you lie in bed and you look out into the jungle and forest and paddy and uh, monkeys will raid your room in a day. So you have to keep all your clothes in the trunk. Uh, you really feel you're in the thick of it. And the lady who runs it, Moli Dasaram, has two cooks, two ladies who go out into the forest every day and forage. You, for dinner, you have whatever they found that day in the forest. And it is just the most beautiful food. It's all vegetarian, but it's just sublime, uh, you know. And I, I could, I've been to stay with Moli twice. I could continue to going there an infinite number of times. You swim in the lake with the crocodiles and there's plenty of wild elephant around there. And Moli and the local farm will take you for a walk. It's a fabulous experience, real, a real treat. Oh, lovely. <laughs> it's tough sitting here listening to all that knowing we can't go just yet. Uh, and on that note, actually, we've had a question from Claire, uh, wondering what the name of the beach was again, where the big ship was. Do you mind yeah, you mention? It's called the Nanti Kadal Lagoon. Okay. So uh, I might get you to write that down, and I'll send that out to yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> out, out to everyone as there's well. There's a photograph in the book. There's a, a map, and it's marked on the map. The ship is marked on the map. Now, please bear in mind, the ship may not be there. As I say, I, I've heard that the Japanese have come and collected it and have collected a lot of the scrap, but that's not to stop you going there. For, for many of us who remember that the end of the war and the film and so on, it's a very evocative place, as well as beautiful. It just makes you think a little bit. Uh, and, you know, to go there and to experience, I think it's very, very special indeed. Uh, and uh, to reflect on it. It's, just be a little bit careful when you do go there. Much of the facilities that are offered there are run by the army. And you may ask yourself whether it's a good idea to stay in hotels that are run by the army. There are human rights organizations that say you shouldn't. Uh, and I think experienced travel won't book you into an army, uh, army run hotel uh, uh, for uh, ethical reasons. Uh, I did stay at an army hotel because I wanted an army guide and I wanted the army to tell me what was going on around there. Uh, and actually it was a very nice hotel and my, the officer showing me around, this chap here was very, very nice guy indeed and very compassionate. Um, uh, he was there in the fighting at the end and had a real compassion for uh, the people, the civilians who were there as well. So you'll find it actually quite an interesting experience if you do come across the army there. Do try and get that amazing part of the world. It's, it's very, very interesting indeed. Lovely, thank you. Um, I know there are a few questions we haven't managed to get to yet, but we are running out of time. Um, but I will make sure to um, pass those on to John and we can follow up with a bit of an email after this, uh, anything that we missed. Um, so thank you very much, John, and we'll just pass over to Melissa now just to wrap things up briefly. But thank you very much for that, John. Thank you. John, that was fantastic. I, I feel um, a little bit um, embarrassed about my own travel artifacts now. I've just got a picture behind me that I bought in London um, that's got Sri Lanka on it and nothing, nothing that I can quite tell is as good a story about. But um, I hope everyone's enjoyed this evening. Um, and, and just before we go, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you are eager as we are to get planning your next adventure. Um, I'm pretty sold on Northern Sri Lanka after that myself. But um, you'll probably have some thoughts or questions about how it's going to work. And we know that um, we know that most people can't wait to travel again. Um, but we want them to be able to do so with confidence. And we're just about to launch what we're calling the COVID promise, um, which we hope will mitigate some of the concerns around travel insurance, um, that, that, that is some of the concerns around travel insurance, excluding potential scenario around, scenarios around COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to go on about it too much here, but I, if you do want to know more about it, just get in touch with us um, for some more details. And I think Kate's also going to attach some information about it on a follow-up email. Um, but personally, I'm just really excited about where the future of travel might take us. Since, since day one at ETG, um, we've really just wanted to make, make travel better. 
Um, and we think there's a great opportunity for that once we all get moving again. Um, I've written a few pages about my thoughts on this. Um, nowhere near as good as, as anything John's written. Um, but um, Kate's also going to attach that to the follow-up email and I hope you'll enjoy reading it. So, so just to finish off, um, we're open for business at ETG. Um, as you know, we're always happy to chat about travel anytime. So, th so thanks again for joining us. Um, hope you can come to the next one too um, and do get in touch to chat or plan in the meantime. Um, and we're really looking forward to the hopefully not too distant future when we can all get out on our travel adventures again. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you very much, John, for joining us. It was a real treat. And I have to say, the planning and organisation of all this, it really made my day when you accepted that invitation. And I hopefully it all made everyone's evening here as well. Um, and most importantly, thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed it and that it lived up to your expectations. Uh, as we mentioned, hopefully this is just the very first of our Bringing Travel Home events. Um, and we will be sending out a bit of a survey after this to get your feedback. So please do let us know what you thought of it. And also let us know if you have any further suggestions or requests for events in the future. Um, you know, we're doing our best to put this all together, but it's all about you and what you want. So make sure you do let us know about what it is that you would enjoy with this. Uh, speaking of future events, as Melissa mentioned, we have our next event coming up at the end of June. And we are really excited uh, about that one. We are going to be hosting our Hushna Tara Prakash of the Glenburn Tea Estate in Darjeeling and the Glenburn Penthouse in Calcutta. Um, she's going to take us on a visual journey through Bengal in East India. Uh, it's, it's kind of this is going to be the story of Bengal. It'll be a bit of history, a bit of culture, some tradition, some food. Um, and that will be at the end of June. So we really hope that you can join us for that one as well. I will be sending out a bit more details about that um, in the next week or so. So keep an eye out for that. But yes, thank you all very much for coming to your screens this evening. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the night. Otherwise, that's it from us. <laughs>